I've spent two months with 4-2 Commando Royal Marines in one of the most dangerous places in Afghanistan, Nad Ali North, a Taliban heartland thick with IEDs and crawling with insurgents. At Checkpoint Toki, the Marines' job was as simple as it was terrifying, to put themselves in harm's way, become the target of Taliban attack, in order to tempt them away from a small, war-ravaged village to the north. The Marines became human bait, or to put it another way, a red rag to the Taliban bull. After a six-month tour, not all the Marines made it back home alive. Seven made the ultimate sacrifice. But many more suffered life-changing injuries. Three of them I had got to know well. Paul Weiss, Weissy. Dog handler, Mick McConnell. And young troop commander, Simon Maxwell. On the stretcher, I started like sort of going. Richie was saying, "No, think of your kids. No, think of Tessa." And I just thought it's got to be bad now. Like, you know, thinking you now if they're saying things like that. There's a smell I remember more than anything. The smell of blood. There's cuts. The blood. He obviously had been brought fresh from the field. You know, straight onto the bed. It's horrible. Just the reality of it. When he was patting me down, saying, don't worry, Mick, it's all still there. Everything's still there. That was just uh, immense. I'll never forget that. In 2014, the plan is for British combat troops to pull out of Afghanistan. And so right now, the main military effort is to stabilize the place and begin the handover of control to the Afghans themselves. This is Lashkagar, the capital city of Helmand province. Lashkagar will be the first of the major towns in Helmand to be handed back to the uh, Afghan National Security Forces, uh, which is a very big step forward indeed for this country. It's a thriving city, buzzing, bustling, but still not without dangers. Even now, as a foreigner, I can't walk freely amongst the people. Instead, I have to ride on the back of an armoured personnel carrier. This is the only way I can really see Lashkagar from the um, top gun position, this armoured vehicle, uh, because people are still not 100% confident about security in the area. And it's the same in the countryside immediately surrounding Lashkagar, free of Taliban control for the last year or so. Nobody's taking any undue chances yet, but there is real hope. The local economies look like they're flourishing. The market stalls are brimming over, and people seem happy, relaxed, and friendly. This is an area of Helmand which is very secure now and, and, and relatively benign. And this is where uh, a lot of uh, a lot of very determined work is done here by a lot of British soldiers in the last two years. And areas like this did give you the very distinct impression that Afghanistan is rising from the ashes, so to speak. And so here, um, I think one could be pretty hopeful, but it's only just over the horizon. And of course, there is still a war being fought in no uncertain terms. Just 10 miles away, the fight is still being taken to the Taliban. This is Nad Ali North, where I spent two months with 4-2 Commando, most of it with L Company at the remote British outpost of Toki, right in the centre 
in what was described then as the most dangerous square mile in the world, still thick with Taliban fighters and laden with deadly IEDs. Nevertheless, the Marines of L Company patrolled the ground every day to reassure the locals, but also to tempt the Taliban into attack. The commandos were constantly monitored by Taliban spies, who were also laying IEDs at every opportunity, and who were taken out when positively identified. Yeah, they work, they work in teams of two, three, four and five. His mate came along there, thinking he was clever, with his icons going to walk in his hand against the wall. And then, oh, good night, Vienna. That's him. Yeah, Sam, mate. The enemy could attack at any time. Nowhere was safe from ambush, but the Marines were always ready to return fire. Pepper left and right of the bud line. Stop them moving out. Shot! Good shot! Good shot! Ping the firing point in here um, as we start putting fire down. So we had about 150 metres off front, um, which was them firing at us. So they were falling short of our position? Yeah, just, just falling short of our position, luckily. Yeah. <laughs> and just to the north, the village of Loimanda that the Marines were protecting. Once a prosperous sheep market, it had fallen into ruins after years as a Taliban stronghold. But now, with the Taliban flushed out, the place was being made safe again. Firing! IEDs being cleared before renovation will transform it into the bustling market village it used to be. And that remains the hope. OK, Ashton, we can get you set in the centre. Certainly. When I went back after just a few weeks, people had started to return. And spontaneous market stalls had started to spring up in the back streets. It was a promising sign, although no guarantee yet that Loy Manda would survive, let alone thrive. Matt, I know it's a tiny little shop, but it's small beginnings, eh? Yes. Six, seven, eight weeks ago, no way could you have this kind of conversation. And I repeat my say, it's still a bit primitive. The atmosphere is right, they don't feel intimidated. Nobody's there saying, oh, but Taliban this, Taliban that. But whatever progress had been made, and whatever seeds of hope had been planted for the future, it came at a high cost. Seven Marines from 4-2 Commando were killed in Nadali North, one of them from L Company itself, and many more were injured, mostly by IEDs. Three of them were by now friends of mine. In the time I spent at Checkpoint Toki, I got to know a lot of the guys well. Living cheek by jowl and facing a common foe, you get close pretty quick. Um, the main threat will be IEDs. Action is on contact IED. Get an IED, OK, with golf, um, self-treat yourself if, if you've got any arms and legs left. All right, lads, prepare for us for three multiple fighting patrol in vicinity of... So I was shocked when I heard that the three I knew best had all been seriously injured. Two, three days ago, basic sort of fighting patrol because you don't, don't want to get com uh, what do you call it? Complacent. Cheers, Eric. Don't want to get complacent around here. Cy Maxwell, a young lieutenant, only 24, and just six months out of training, suffered a life changing injury after stepping on a landmine. Paul Weiss, known to all of us as Vicey, 27, and on his fourth tour of Afghanistan. A master of gallows humour, he sustained terrible injuries from a huge fragmentation mine. When are you going home? Uh, hopefully. About four days in yeah. a four-foot coffin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first to be injured was not a Marine at all, but an RAF dog handler seconded to the Marines with his sniffer dog, Memphis. I have formed quite a close bond with a dog. Yeah. And I've been dog handling for about 14 years, and he's the first dog I've had I want as a pet. I just have to sweet talk my girlfriend when I get back in R&R &R and then see if she'll allow him in the house. But if I'm sure if I buy her something shiny, then Memphis could come home with me and be a pet dog. The diamonds always work for girls, don't they? Mick and Memphis's job was to seek out deadly IEDs 
an incredibly dangerous task. As usual, they were right at the front of the patrol the day it happened. The things that I can remember clearly is I was looking across the, the field in front of me and I could actually see the farmers and the, the young children running away, which was really unusual. And just as that was happening, I stepped to my left and triggered the IED. Mix evacuation after the explosion was captured on camera. I went down onto my left side and uh, as I went down, I, I was screaming because people had told me they could hear me in the checkpoint, really screaming. And the young Marine who Joe was in front of me has actually just jumped on top of me and started patting me down and said, Mick, don't worry, Mick, it's all still there. Everything's still there. Yeah. That was just uh, immense. I'll never forget that. My foot was just burning, it was red hot and uh, shocked more than anything because you don't know what's wrong with you, you don't know what that blast's done. Mick was incredibly lucky. The IED's main charge only partially detonated, but that was enough to shatter his left foot and ankle. Oh, this will be out of shit all. Hey! There you see there, you know what I mean? Memphis never normally barks, but now being separated from Mick, he was barking like crazy. Mick, did you tell Lorna exactly what happened that day? Yeah. Yeah, I had to tell her because she was, uh, you know, because we're going to get married and we're going to be together and we're not going to have secrets from each other. And it's, it's best just to talk about it. We talked at, at length about injuries and what ifs before I'd went on tour to prepare ourselves for it, you know, and, uh, and that helped when we come back, yeah. you know, that we knew to be open with each other and to tell her what's happened. But that also meant showing Lorna the footage of mixed evacuation. It's all a bit too real for me. Um, I kind of wish I hadn't watched it, um, but it just... Why is that long? Just... Uh, just the reality of it. And... I think sometimes you, when you know certain information, you have this picture in your head, but now I have, obviously not when it actually happened, but what happened after it, I, I've seen it now for real. Um, I don't know, I think maybe that will change in time and it will help. Since been told it, it must have been about 14 minutes from the initiation of the IED to being on the mare and away. But during that, that 14 minutes, it, you, you know, your, your head goes through so many things. I can remember saying to the lads, because I was awake the whole time from the initiation straight through to I uh, got to Birmingham the next day, I can remember saying to the guys, at least I won't have to walk around here for the next month and a half, you know, <laughs> thank God for small mercies. <laughs> Within a quarter of an hour, Mick was in Camp Bastion. And within 24 hours, he'd been flown to Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Birmingham, where they desperately tried to save his foot. I think everyone knows that members of the military can be cynical about their jobs, but the care that I've received is second to none. From getting that initial first aid by the, the, the Joe to the help that I received on the mare at Bastion, on the sea cast into uh, Bryce Norton, and Birmingham and Headley. Basically with the injury, my heel is uh, totally fractured into hundreds of pieces. Uh, I had a dislocation of the ankle, so my foot was hanging off. I'm on plenty of medication, but it's, uh, even on the medication, it hurts to 
Put my foot on the floor. They did offer to get a stain of stair lift in, but uh, you know, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could live with that. And at what point will you have to decide between keeping the foot or not? But the thing for me is I don't want a stick or a limp, so maybe down the line I will let like for an amputation because the majority of guys are walking normally and you wouldn't know they had it. Yeah. Don't expect it. I used to get a little bit frustrated when people used to say he's so lucky because I used to think he's not lucky. Nobody that comes home injured is lucky. Um, but I, I know what they were trying to say. Um, I'm very thankful that um, things weren't a lot worse. But um, I don't see it as lucky. Luck, or rather bad luck, plays a large part in a war in which IEDs count for most of the deaths and injuries. Vicey knew that from day one. Everyone knows it's, it's IED central. There's, 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 you know, the ground is absolutely riddled of them. And eventually we are going to set patterns and, and sure as shit, they're going to get lucky sooner, sooner or later. You know? And as well drilled and well trained as you can be, your luck's going to run out sooner or later, and luck does play a big part in it. Within weeks, Vicey was blown up by a fragmentation mine, red-hot shrapnel tearing through his body and neck. Vice is lucky to be alive, and now back with his family in Exeter. They brought me inside and told me that Paul had been critically injured in an IED blast. And I, I, I went into a state of shock. About four in the morning, I drove up to Birmingham, and then had to wait around until about one until I saw him. Felt like ages, felt like days. I, mean, I think I remember you walking in. That's when I th you, you cried, didn't you, first when you first saw him? Kind of, it like, yeah. took my breath away, not, not me for six. It's horrible. It's the smell, the the cuts, the blood. He obviously had been bought fresh from the field, you know, straight onto the bed, and he was covered in mud, grit, blood. This is good stuff. Yeah, all the good stuff. <laughs> Vicey had 114 significant wounds, needing 159 staples. He had over 300 pieces of shrapnel and stones taken out of his torso, limbs and neck. He was left with a heart condition and deaf in one ear. And it all happened on a routine patrol that started like a hundred others Vicey had done. I remember we set off just before first light and um, we went straight away, we crossed over a little stream and we were going through 10, 12 foot um, sort of corn. Yeah, it's red hot. I, was, I remember it was still getting hot straight away. I was fourth back from the front. Jordan started heading off up, up to um, um, up toward the junction, and he shouted out, oh, there's, "There's loads of kids just ran away." And as we know, that's like a combat indicator that you know something's about to go down. As I was looking over to the direction the kids ran, I just see two blokes just got hunkered down in, in the corner of the field. And I just thought, "Fucking, that's a bit weird." And then as I looked down, I sort of followed my trailer side down, I just saw this like, oil drum, about that big, um, just poking through the bottom of the wall. And straight away I knew what it was, I thought, fuck. <laughs> and I was led down the floor and I was sort of thinking, fuck, you know. And I thought, right, I've got to sort myself out. And I know I put my arm down my left, I was led on my side, I'd put my hand down my leg, felt, felt my foot, and I thought, oh, that's still there. I went down my other leg and I could just feel my, my, the bottom half of my leg. I thought, well, that's still there. And then I remember going to my arm and I couldn't feel my arm. And because I, I was dead on my side, I couldn't see it. And I thought, oh, fuck, I've lost my arm. And so I went to grab my um, tourniquet out my sort of shirt pocket. And then as I was feeling around for it, I, I sort of like slipped and I put my hand inside my neck. So my two fingers went actually inside my neck and I quickly pulled it out. And then I sort of touched it again and I just felt, and I've, thought, fuck, this is bad now. His main carotid artery had been almost completely severed. He was losing blood in torrents. I remember saying, oh, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake. And I was like, even trying to like, just, just to wriggle sort of thing, to try and stay, stay awake. And I just thought, if I fucking go to sleep now, I'm never gonna wake up. 
And then, especially when Richie said, think of your kids, and Tess, I just thought, fucking hell. You know, this is it, this is, I'm gonna fucking die on this shit old country. Fellow Marine, Richie Pencott, stemmed the bleeding by putting his knee into Vice's neck. This saved his life. I'm like, I just stay awake, and I was going, fucking hell, you know, stay awake, stay awake. And then I remember, I remember going, and then I just thought, fuck, this is it, you know, I'm dead. And then I, I sort of, my vision sort of went a bit funny. It was like I saw, like, a minute picture, but everything else was black all around. And then it sort of shot in, like, it zoomed in a real quick zoom, and I was back, and I was like, fucking hell. Go, 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 go! The medical team on the helicopter continued the battle to bring Vicey back from the brink. He died twice. Both times they restarted his heart. They gave him 14 pints of blood. I think they was coming out as quick as they were pumping in, sort of thing. You know, where my artery was 95% severed, it was hanging on by a thread, sort of thing. And then it was just so happened that there was the best vascular surgeon in like the UK had just arrived in Bastion. And, uh, you know, and he, he saved my life, sort of thing, took the vein out of my leg. Uh, which I was a bit weird about. I think, you know, if they take it out of my leg, I mean, surely I need that, you know, so I think they might just cut and shut it or just completely... Uh, That's the scar, Yeah, it goes right up, you know, up there. Well, I've obviously lost so much blood um, to the brain. I, I've got, got a brain injury. Um, you know, a bit of my brain has died, um, which then caused my hand not, not to work. It was originally my whole arm. Uh, but I've got sort of a glove effect now on my hand, whereas you know I can't. I can't individual. I could do like I can move my hand open and close it, but I can't. You know, I can't individually move any of the fingers. Right. You know, I can open and close it, but that that's as much as much as I get, and I've got no strength in it right. anymore. But you know, I'm, I'm having a course of Botox in that, um, so it looked really young. So that'd be that'd be quite good. Vicey <laughs> uh, is making great progress but the healing to body and mind is going to take a long time. Marines has held in, across the world has been, you know, a good fighting force. And to go from sort of being in the top sort of 10% in the world of what I did to coming down to what I am now, you know, it's fucking... It makes me fucking ang angry, really angry. And I, I just feel that they've taken away from me Something I was good at, because I was fucking shit in school. Academically, I can't do shit, but, you know, soldiering is what I was good at, and now they've taken it away from me. I'd like to take a lot of things away from them, which is their lives. And if I didn't have Tessa and the kids, like, you know, with me now, I'd be straight on that plane, with disabled or not, straight out on that plane, with a fucking great big chain gun, and I'd just go mow them down. The Taliban? Yeah. Just have hatred towards them. Vicey will never see frontline action again, but he will always have the comrades he fought alongside, the Marines of Lima Company, who he's now preparing to see for the first time since his injury. RAF Bryce Norton where the men of L Company returned after their six-month deployment to Afghanistan. <laughs> Waiting for them, family and friends, including, of course, Vicey. I've got this little sort of burning feeling in my chest, sort of thing, thinking, oh, God, I just, just can't wait to see them. I'm just excited, but I know, obviously, they want to see that their families as well. My injury's been and gone, you know, it's all about the lads now getting back, making their all sort of mentally sound, you know, just getting on with their adjustment process of coming back to home life and just enjoying their leave. <laughs> oh man, it's good to see you. <laughs> Okay. You big ugly fuck, how are you doing? <laughs> All mates together once again. But the one Marine Vicey most wanted to see was the man who knelt on his open neck wound immediately after the explosion, stemming the bleeding and saving Vice's life. 
Richie Pencott. Yeah, and then when I when I uh, when he he came through the door of the arrivals land, just sort of uh, felt a bit bad because I just sort of mugged a couple of people off. If it wasn't for Richie initially getting to me, I, I'd be dead now. There he is. Cover it. Hi, mate. Thanks so much, mate. Don't worry. Don't fucking worry. Just look. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a gnarly scar, isn't it? Oh, it was a good feeling, but it's not one I want to repeat again in a, in a sort of weird way, you know, because Owen so somebody so much, and there's there's nothing I can do now which I think will will ever ever re repay him for what he's done for me and my, my family, because you know it's been it's been a hard road, and uh, I'm still on it. But you know I can't ever ever thank the, the pair of them enough. Welcome home, Frankie. How you feeling, mate? Vicey organised a slug of port for every Marine that day. His own inimitable way of welcoming back the men he'd fought with side by side. You shouldn't be having one because you killed the fucking duck. <laughs> I remember every single person I've ever been on ops with. You know, it's a bond that will ever be broken. It's, it's weird because, like, people, to me, jumping out of a plane is fucking mental, but... You know, to other people, getting shot at man, but we fucking love it. I mean, there's, as long as you don't get hit, it is fucking brilliant. There's no buzz like it. I mean, you know, you've been with us when it's going on. Yeah, at the time, you, you're focused, you're doing what you have to do. You know, you're killing them. And even, like, close shades with IEDs and, and you laugh about it. You just laugh at it. And it is a sick sense of humour in a way, but it's, it's how, we, how we get by. And I think it's that sort of extraordinary experience that you share. Yeah. That sort of binds you so tightly. <laughs> also at the airport was Simon Maxwell, the young troop commander and the last of the injured trio from Toki I'd got to know well. It's, it's weird when, when you're out there, you literally just do anything for any bloke in your troop. There's lads here who've dragged themselves out from QE, they've only been, you know, come out of theatre a week ago and they've come down the wheelchairs, you know, meet the lads coming in and stuff. Um, I think I said before, you, know, you, can't, you can't buy that. Um, it's open. Simple sliding doors separate two worlds. And on both sides, family. One side, the marine family, bidding each other a temporary farewell. And on the other side, the real family have been waiting six months for this moment. Mission. We're going to lay an ambush in vicinity of Yankee One Charlie, Compound 13, in order to kill local Taliban fighters and dickers. Have an up out. When I first met Simon Maxwell at Checkpoint Toki, he'd only been out of training four months. This was his first tour of duty. After I'd left Afghanistan, he wrote to me from Toki, saying all was well and that he had absolutely no intention of getting hurt. We were patrolling down to a CP, um, so it was a fairly long patrol, and towards the end of the day, came under contact pretty much straight away. Um, which was, wasn't any, particularly unusual for slang place we were, you know, it's quite small arms five is a fairly sort of usual part of it. The whole way down we sort of followed the river and it was quite sort of, uh, quite Gucci sort of, you know, in, in the reeds sort of snuggling along. And then we came back across open ground. It was, it was my decision to, you know, use that open ground. Um, and basically I just, I just stood in the device, open, completely open ground, not channeled at all, um, and just went up in the air. The blast, I, I can't remember the sort of flight time, but I can remember landing in the, in the ditch and then sort of looking down. First reaction was just, it was weird, it wasn't, it didn't feel like, 
But the first thing I started doing was hitting the bank and saying, fuck, this shouldn't have been me, it wasn't supposed to be me, sort of thing. And then, yeah, and then you get the pain shooting through and stuff, and you know, out there the ditches are just full of just, they, you know, they, they crap on them. Um, I just remember getting the smell of that as well, so that was nice. I mean, the lads were saying you'd definitely be able to keep the foot and stuff, but you can just, I mean, I could, yeah. Um, I, could, I could feel it, it was, uh, it was fucked, basically. <laughs> I was sort of saying to the medic, um, why is he? I was going, fuck, this, this, this fucking hurts. I was like, are they, gonna, are they gonna knock me out on the helicopter? And uh, the sergeant major, who just happened to be on patrol, just sort of came in my face and was like, I'll fucking knock you out, sir, you don't stop fucking moaning. Ah, uh, all right, yeah. <laughs> They've got lads cracking jokes and stuff, you know, when they're injured, you've got to sort of try and join the trend. Um, well basically, with the, with the leg, uh, it, wa it was down lower um, when they first cut it off and then they had to amputate it up a bit further. Um, but, I mean, the surgeons in Bastion and in QE are hoofing are really, really good, so it's just a sort of clean skull all the way around, almost like a smiley face. Mm -hmm. I've been winding up the missus saying I'm going to get two little eyes <laughs> tattooed there, <laughs> so it looks like a crocodile. After hospital, all the injured come here to Headley Court for rehabilitation. So this is the um, this is the Waterloo gym, and this is basically um, where you do most of your rehab, so the exercise rehab side of it. Simon has always been a keen athlete, and he wasn't going to let losing a limb change that. Watch me hang out when you're up on the leg and stuff. Um, yeah, this, this sort of keeps you fit when you're up on it. Apparently it is hard work. People kept telling me, right, you'll have dark times ahead, you know, you'll have snags and stuff and that sort of stuff, but you come to a place, you see them in Bassey and you come to a place like Headley Court and you see lads with, like, triple amputees and stuff, and I, I won't know names, there's a, there's a bootneck in here who's triple amputee, who's just hoofing, like, I've never heard him complain, never heard him moan. Um, you, you see lads like that and it's, you just can't ever get annoyed about your own situation because at the end of the day, it's a foot, do you know what I mean? I'm, yeah, you'd be right. Three months after his amputation, Simon is about to get a new leg. Hasn't been used in a while. No. <laughs> basically, getting the, hopefully, getting the possessive leg on for the first time. So, hopefully, first time walking, basically. So, it's quite a big day, really? Yeah, cross fingers. <laughs> cross fingers, but we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> What's the sort of time frame you usually see on guys who sort of injury? I know it differs from person to person, so it's hard to tell the rest of it, but... Is it? Yeah. In terms of... Before you get to where? Uh, running. It doesn't have to take a long time. You know, if everything goes ideally, you're talking, you know, a couple of months sort of thing. Sure. Um, I take it there's some sort of uh, thing you're desperate to do, isn't it? Well, uh, yeah, we were talking about uh, hopefully Iron Man by next July, but we'll see. <laughs> and have you done Iron Man's before? <laughs> Iron Man, Simon, that's just big marine talk. Now you've got to deliver. <laughs> you watch me fall over after 10 metres now. Uh, I don't necessarily want you putting all your weight on straight away, so that's. Okay, so the foot's a bit far out at the moment. Right, can you take the one or do you need to take the one? Good, have a seat. Okay. Yeah, right. that's how you feel. <clears throat> you need to make sure you bend your knee, because bending your knee gives you ground clearance. Okay. It doesn't feel like a foot, though. So it is, yeah, it's just, it's the... Uh... You're not going to be happy, are you, at all? <laughs> right, if I can do keep you up at ease with this on the first time. <laughs> <laughs> nah. <laughs> <laughs> The reason why you join the Marines is for you know the excitement, and the buzz, and you know I certainly got that. Um, albeit it ended slightly not how I want it to end. But um, if, if it doesn't work out, the Marines for whatever reason, if I can't go back and do the job I was doing before, I'll roll the punches. I'll, I'll find something else to do. Someone will have me somewhere. Um, yeah, but hopefully, it, hopefully it won't come to that. We'll see. The Marines will help rehabilitate Simon, and if they can, allow him to keep his job. If not, they'll retrain him for anything he wants in Civvy Street. Just, yeah, just put him, you know, just even standing up instead of being in a wheelchair on crutches, it's really good. Um, feels strange, it hurts a little bit, not too much. Um, but and I'm, as I said, I'm doing some sort of weird, like, bops of the hip and stuff, but, yeah, I'll, I'll get you started for a while. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's good, it's, yeah, it's even, yeah. <laughs> um, 
It's trainer. Simon is very determined not to let his injury hold him back. The same with Mick and, of course, Micey. Three men, comrades, blown up in Afghanistan within a couple of weeks of each other, are now in the process of rebuilding their shattered lives. Mick McConnell, blown up in Afghanistan, is still convalescing. But right now, he's heading to Lincoln to RAF Waddington, where he's being reunited with an old friend. Well, today I've just finished uh, my third week of rehab down at Headley Court, and I'm now on my way to RAF Waddington to pick up Memphis, and I'm really quite excited about it. I've been looking forward to this day for a long time. After three tours in Afghanistan, Springer Spaniel Memphis is being retired. The RAF is allowing Mick to adopt him. The last time they saw each other was the day Mick was injured. I'm just hoping he recognises my voice and recognises me. <laughs> so, fingers crossed. But if not, I could just bribe him into loving us again anyway. <laughs> With a biscuit? Yeah, plenty of treats in any's anybody's. <laughs> so, he'll be fine. So, what's happening, son? Um, so, we can go for a run. Uh, basically, just getting changed into the sort of running kit. Um, and getting the running blade on, which is fairly new. Yeah, he's uh, yeah, thoroughly Gucci. It's a good bit, good bit of kit. Simon Maxwell lost a leg to a Taliban landmine six months ago. He's now back in training with a vengeance. Just got that on, didn't I? Liz, you've been seeing Simon for seven years. This must have been a shock to you. Yeah, it was a shock at the at the very beginning, but it's. I think everyone was surprised at how quickly we all kind of just got used to it. Now it's not really, uh, it's not much of an issue. Right. You good? You okay. Feeling good, yeah? <laughs> Feels weird, it doesn't really feel like a, a proper leg, you know, obviously. But it's, you know, as near as you can get to it, really. What's your main ambition at the moment? Uh, at the moment, Ironman. We're doing that in July. So there's quite a few of us doing that. Um, so it should be good. It's just, it's just a challenge to get me out of bed, really, you know, um, sort of next. Next thing to crack. Being out there with that group of lads in Tokyo, in Lumande, in in um, you know, in all the other TPs we were in, you can't you can't buy that. Um, and it was just it was just hoof, it was just hoofing to have and see and yeah, it's, it's, it was good to be part of. And I don't I don't regret for a second anything that's happened to me um, at all. Excited? Yeah, oh, yeah. Me mega excited. Yeah, expensive though. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Mix picked up his fiance Lorna, who's going with him to collect Memphis. How are you feeling, Lorna? Apprehensive. Yeah, but excited. Yeah. Excited. Yeah. You can't wait to spoil him, can I you? Know, I know. <laughs> He's in the crew room, mate. He's in the uh, dispensary. And here. Hey, yeah, Memphis. Memphis, come here. Yeah, yeah, good boy. Ah, oh, too much going on. Memphis, come, come, come. He smells really good, doesn't he? Come here, you. Oh, it's good to see you, man. Come on, Laura, you get my pet. <laughs> so lovely. Been waiting a long time for yeah, this, yeah, a long time. It's just lovely. It's really emotional. I didn't expect to feel like this, but <laughs> <laughs> he's looking good, hasn't he? How is it, mate? Yeah, oh, it's fantastic. That is fantastic. Yeah, gives the ball. Yeah, is that too cold for you, Memphis? Good lad. Oh, he's still as clumsy as ever. <laughs> it's good to see that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's good. Oh, shit, now they're gone. Oh! <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. And what a vicey, the worst injured of all. Well, after a lot of soul searching, he's decided to leave the Marines. I'm not an idiot. I know, I know I'm, yeah, that's my career over. But. You know, I'm, I'm not in no rush, and the, the Marines, the, the one thing they are good at is that they, they look after you, because we're such a small, like, corps. Yeah. They'll look after you, and they're, um, they'll retrain me in whatever I want to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
you know, they wouldn't let me go until I'm happy, which is, you know, so I, I could get another couple of years yet. So, because I want to go to um, uni and do a project management course for building. That, that's the plan. But, right. You know, see, see where it takes me. How do you feel about that, Tessa, now, Paul? Obviously, his career is I think, to be in there. I think I'm finding it harder to take in than Paul, to be honest, because, like I say, it's all I've ever known. It's all the kids have ever known. That's how we've lived for the last 10 years. So I, I am finding it harder to grasp than Paul. I still think that he, there's a chance he could stay in the Marines. He says no, but... You can't stay in the Marines with hearing aids. Yeah, you can. Gammy foot. <laughs> <laughs> you're saying you, you used to sing, didn't you? Yeah, but um, where it's the shrapnel's gone into me, I can't shout you anymore. I, I can't. Um, it just breaks me. Ah, sounds all, sounds all rubbish. Yeah, I can't sing anymore. Either. You can't sing. No, <laughs> I would try and give you a little taste of it, but I uh, don't want to break the camera. <laughs> well, they used to sing. They used to sing out in Turkey, didn't they? The old guitar. Yeah, I used to have a little sing song, but well, that's over now. Thanks, Terry. What's that? Your singing voice. Yeah, it's gone, isn't it? I'm just shouting. I bet you. I bet you're glad I can't shout. I don't now, think though. it was ever there, Paul. Oh, come on. <laughs> come off it. Not extracting material then. Oh Tessa. my goodness! You should have heard him. He sounds like you. Honey, it's scary. And Afghanistan. What about its destiny? Its own hopes for the future? I went back to make my own judgment. Back first to Lashkagar, the capital of Helmand province, to witness the first stages of transition. The transfer of responsibility from the international forces to the Afghans themselves. So today, Afghanistan takes its first tentative steps towards uh, transition, and the whole world is watching. This was an historical event, but highly stage managed for the press and visiting dignitaries. A headline message to the world that Afghanistan is at last on the mend. But for me, that message was not to be heard here, as clearly as I hoped it could be heard about 10 miles away. Not in a big city, but deep in the rural district of Nad Ali North, the place that the Marines liberated from the Taliban six months previously. The village of Loimanda, for years war-torn, deserted and in ruins. But look at it now, a fledgling bazaar has emerged. About 20 shops so far. It's a small beginning, but a beginning it is. Now, if peace can be nailed down, secured in the long term, who knows what Loimanda will be in five years, 10 years, 20 years, and many other similar villages are rising from the ashes throughout Helmand. Seven Marines of 4-2 Commando died in the defense of Loimanda. The 100 men of L Company alone suffered a 20% casualty rate. That's one in five, killed, blinded, brain damaged, or who lost limbs. And all for this bazaar. But consider this. Loy Manda is Afghanistan writ small. Success is here thanks to the sacrifices of all those lost. And men like Vaisi, Simon and Mick could spread throughout Helmand province. And perhaps, just perhaps, deliver Afghanistan from the turmoil and chaos that's gripped it for a generation or more. Operation Herrick 14, Roll of Honour, 14 Commando, Royal Marines. Marine Nigel Dino Mead, Lieutenant Oliver Augustine, Marine Samuel Alexander, Military Cross, Lance Corporal Martin Gill, Marine James Wright, Sergeant Barry Weston, Marine David Fairbrother, 